What's up guys and welcome back to Monink. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Heya, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here to see what happens at the end of the Iliad because we are literally on the penultimate episode which is blowing my mind. Where is the time gone? Anyways, if that sounds like you, even if that doesn't, then you guys are gonna wanna hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But onto the topic of today's video and today we're gonna be going into book 23 of Homer's Iliad. So if I could summarize book 23 into one sentence, it would just be funeral games for Patroclus. That's literally all that happens in this. It's actually a really long book. It's a very dull book. As you guys know, if you guys have been watching this series, you'll know that I really like war. I really like it when like there's a lot of action happening. There is not a lot of action in this book. And it's just a lot of like, here are the prizes. Here's the race. Do the race. Get the prize. Here's more prizes. It's f dull. I'm going to be totally honest with you. It is about a thousand lines of that as well. So this is a really long chapter. Like my notes, just so you guys know. Eight pages. Four pages, double-sided of typing. Not writing. Typing. So I'll be leaving out a bunch of detail because I don't have time for that. You don't have time for that. I want to go out for drinks later, quite honestly. And I have left this very late in the day. So we are just going to be sort of fast forwarding through all of the boring details. I will again, as per normal, I will point out when I'm missing uh, scenes, I'm missing chapters, well, not chapters, just scenes, chapters. That would be excessive. But I'll point that out for you guys so that you guys can go back to the text and you can check it out if you need it for class or anything like that. But in saying all of that, we are adding more time onto the episode. So let's just roll into uh, the narrative. At the end of the last book, at the end of book 22, I left you guys with Hector being killed by Achilles. So the book opens with basically the morning in the Trojan side continuing, uh, except we cut to the Greeks and we really follow the Greeks as they go back into the Greek camps, right? More specifically, we follow Achilles and his men. So while Achilles tells all of the Greeks, basically like you can go back to your shelters and you should eat because it's coming to like nightfall at this point, he tells all of them that. He then also signals to the Myrmidons like, ha, everybody but not you, okay? We have to go and still mourn Patroclus appropriately. So they all stay in their chariots. They then drive around the body of Patroclus like three times. They're all like mourning and they're all really sad and Thetis, Achilles' mum, she encourages like more mourning in them because she wants everyone to be even more sad. And so they're all like really like wailing and crying on their chariots. Like what a weird scene where they're just like, oh, I'm so sad, but you need to keep moving horses, but I'm so sad right now. That's basically what's happening. And then Achilles isn't on his chariot. He actually gets off his chariot. He walks up to the body of Patroclus and he basically starts like crying over it. And he says to Patroclus, I did everything that I told you to do. Like, look, even Hector's off in the corner. He's sort of like motions over one way and Hector's body is, you know, like in tatters basically and his face is in the dirt and all of this. He's like, look, even I did that. And he also got the 12 young men, as I've mentioned before. Um, he wanted those like Trojan young men to like slaughter in front of Patroclus and nah. For literally no reason, but he also has them. So he tells Patroclus that as well. And not that Patroclus can respond and be like, thanks dude. But he, anyways, that's that's what happens. So the men go about the body of Patroclus like three times, right? And they hop off their chariots and they all like go to sit down. And Achilles says that he's going to make this like massive banquet feast for all of them, or probably had made. Like he's gonna have somebody else make it. Like he won't do it. He did the skewers at one point, but I don't think he can handle this. So he says that that's gonna happen. And he like leads out all of these animals and they're all gonna be slaughtered in front of them and all of this sort of shebang. But the Greek heroes, whilst sort of all of that is happening, this core group of Greek heroes who are unnamed in the text, they come forward to Achilles and they say like, hey, Agamemnon wants to see you. Come to his tent. So Achilles goes to Agamemnon's tent where Agamemnon tries to encourage him to wash off all of the blood and all of the dirt on him because remember, Remember that Achilles is literally disgusting at this point. This is a man who has refused to eat, he's refused to sleep, he's refused to do anything, drink, clean himself, whatever, because of Patroclus being, you know, dead. So Agamemnon is trying to encourage him to do that. So as Achilles enters, he like orders for a cauldron of water to start boiling and all of this so they can, you know, start to clean Achilles, literally just like wash him off. And Achilles is like, no, that would be so disrespectful towards Patroclus and so disrespectful to do in front of Zeus, he would agree with me that we can't do this until Patroclus is burned on the pyre. Not only until Patroclus is burned though, but Achilles also stresses that he won't do it until Patroclus is also buried, until there's like a mound of earth over him. He's like, I'm gonna be disgusting until then because Patroclus deserves it and I don't deserve anything better than this. And you're a bit like, okay, Achilles, I see your point and I like really respect it, but at the same time, you probably smell really f bad. So think about Patroclus in that sense. Like, do we think that Patroclus would wanna smell you like this? Probs not, so like clean yourself, please. After this, Achilles says that his pain is so bad that he would never feel a second pain that is even on par with the pain that he feels because Patroclus is dead. And that is also why he is not cleaning himself or eating or sleeping or doing any of that stuff because of the pain. And he says, nothing will ever come to this 
par to this level of pain that I'm feeling now. And I just want to stress for you guys that Achilles has a son, okay? So this man has a son called Neoptolemus, Pyrrhus, he comes in after this, like, like in later mythology. And so that's Achilles' son, and not once does he mention like, hey, I might feel this bad if my son dies, or like, maybe if my son got injured, I might feel this bad. It might come on par with this. Patroclus dying is on par with how I would feel if Neoptolemus were to pass before his time. He says none of this shit. He could not give <laughs> less of a crap about his son, and I just think that is so telling and it's genuinely what makes it really really gay for me that like we have these moments where I'm like this man has a son doesn't give two shits about him now I've tried to stay I'm talking really fast I'm so sorry but I've tried to stay very close to the original Greek text when I've been talking about the relationship between Patroclus and Achilles and I've just been saying you know this is why lots of people think that they were like in love and this is why and blah blah, blah but we don't have those Greek words but when you hear this on top of everything else right not like an isolated sentence on top of everything else this is like the gayest shit I've ever heard genuinely and after he says this he asks Agamemnon and all of the men who are standing there to go and help him gather up timber uh, in the morning and he says like can you please help me do that so that way we can actually burn Patroclus and I can get my shit together we can all get our together we can go and get Troy but we need more timber we need loads and loads of wood because the more wood the faster Patroclus will burn and we don't have to like stand around and watch him like burn slowly that would be like really icky so all of the men agree they go and they eat dinner and then they go to bed now this is a very famous scene because Achilles himself goes down to the beach to go and sleep and when he's on the beach he does actually fall into sleep and he's visited by Patroclus's ghost okay this is literally where every single story after this gets it from because Achilles was the first guy to be haunted by his dead lover just want to say that right now so little ghost Patroclus shows up and he's like yo Achilles what the fuck is all this about why aren't I buried yet because he highlights that because he's unburied, because he has not been given the correct burial rights and, and all of this stuff, he's currently stuck in like a soul limbo, right? So he can't get into the underworld unless they bury him, unless they give him the correct practice. He is now stuck. This is a very big mythological thing. So that's basically what the ghost of Patroclus says to Achilles. He's like, get your shit together. Come on, help me out. Patroclus says in this moment that it's important for Achilles to accept this because it was his destiny. It was Patroclus' destiny to die in this way in the same way that it's Achilles' destiny to die in like a hot second, right? So that would be Achilles' destiny. This is Patroclus' destiny, and Patroclus says you have to be okay with this. Now, after Patroclus says this, we're about to get real gay, okay? So basically, Patroclus then says, it's my last request, I'm a ghost, it's not my last request. I would really love it if you could make sure that our bones do not be laid apart from one another in death. So he asks Achilles to ask his mother to get this, like, single urn for the both of them, so that when their bones, so when their bones, so when their bones are burned, even, that they will both be placed in the same urn, and that they will both have the same sort of, like, funeral, not pyre, but, like, a mound, sort of, like, a, not a grand resting place, but, like, a place where they can, like, be buried. But be buried together. Okay, that's the key. He wants them to be buried together. And Achilles is obviously like, F yes, I don't know how you came here as a ghost to, like, tell me all this shit. But like, I respect it, I hear it, and I will make it happen, and I will tell my mother to do all these things. And Achilles, it's really sad, Achilles like gets up to go and like hug Patroclus because he's like, if only we could hug like one last time. And as he goes over to Patroclus to hug his spirit, his spirit like drifts away, and Achilles wakes up, because obviously this was a dream. Achilles wakes up, and he wakes up with a thin cry, and he's like calling out for Patroclus, and you're like, oh my god, my heart! He then calls out to all of his men as he wakes up, and he says that the soul of an unhappy Patroclus has come to visit him, and then he goes to the body uh, and he mourns for Patroclus a little bit more but like in public and everybody can see him and they're like we should probably give him a moment. So now that it's the morning everybody goes to get the wood that they had like promised to kill us and they would get the day before. They all go to get the wood and when they all come back with the wood they basically end up making this like gigantic pyre for just one body for just Patroclus. They make this gigantic thing and it goes on for like hundreds of yards, I just totally made up that like measurement, but it goes on for ages, right? Patroclus is placed in the middle, Achilles even cuts a lock of his hair that apparently his father had promised that Achilles would cut only for like some river deity at some point. Once again, you can go and find that in the book, I'm not explaining that whole backstory, but there's this whole lock of hair thing where then Achilles cuts his, his hair and then puts it on the hands of Patroclus, his little like dead body. Thing and it's like, oh. But this whole thing takes like all day, okay? So like gathering all the wood, bringing it all back. Like this is all described in the Iliad. I'm just missing it out. And it takes them all day to the point where now we're getting to the end of the day again, okay? So Achilles then turns to Agamemnon after this whole like morning moment thing. He turns to Agamemnon and he says, look, everybody will obey you more so than they'll obey me. Can you please tell them all to go and like eat and all of this and just leave the best heroes here with Patroclus on his pyre for, for right now so that we can all continue the morning and we can, you know, get his body lit, basically, for lack of a better phrase. I have no other way of saying that. So basically, he says, can you do that? Agamemnon's like, sure. And he tells everybody to 
off basically so that they can have some private morning time with Patroclus. Once everybody's gone, Achilles has all this time to then sacrifice all of the animals that he needs to in order to make this burial correct. So he sacrifices a bunch of like cattle, he sacrifices a bunch of sheep as well. And then he gets the fat from these animals and he wraps Patroclus in it. I think that's to help it burn, but I'm not entirely sure. But either way, he does that and he sort of then lines up all of the animals like around the pyre. He then sacrifices and kills the 12 youths, the Trojan youths that he said that he would kill. He then kills all of them. He puts them around the pyre as well. So like none of them are, are near Patroclus. This is important for later. So none of them are near Patroclus. We then have four horses that are also put on the pyre and then two dogs, but there are like nine dogs in total and they're all sort of like running around, but only two of them are like legitimately sacrificed like on the pyre, the rest of them are just sort of like running amok. Achilles then again addresses Patroclus and says another formal goodbye. And he also stresses to Patroclus, not to anybody else. Like, don't worry, Hector is not on this pyre with you because the dogs will get him. Like I've left him for the dogs. Remember, as I said before, Hector is literally face down in the dirt at this point. Like Achilles just left his tattered body in the corner of the camp, except the dogs don't actually come to it. So basically Aphrodite has been protecting Hector's body because she feels so bad for what Achilles has done to Hector, because bear in mind, she's on the side of the Trojans, that she has actually been protecting his body from the dogs. So Aphrodite has been placing this like immortal like ointment on Hector so that that way his body, every single time, you know, Achilles wants to either drag him round or any of this sort of stuff that his, his skin isn't tearing. But also we have Apollo who's then making sure that the sun is never directly on Hector's body. So that, that way his body isn't, you know, gross. So he doesn't look as bad as he should in this moment. And the dog's not attacking him. The, the worms are not attacking him, like nothing. He's in pretty good condition considering what he's been going through. Obviously he doesn't look good as new because then Achilles would pretty much be like, this is scary, but it is, on a level of like, he should definitely just be bones at this point, and yet he's not. Cut back to Achilles though, and he's trying to light the pyre, and he cannot, this man cannot light up Patroclus's pyre, which is obviously really awkward. So he then in this moment has a great idea of praying to the winds. He prays to Zephyrus and Boreas, who are the uh, west and north winds. Zephyrus is the west wind, Boreas is the north wind. He prays to those two gods. Yes, by the way, each direction of wind is a different god. And then there are different types of winds that are also called different things. So like fast winds and warm winds and all of them, they are also different deities. But we have Boreas and Zephyrus right now who are being prayed to by Achilles. And he's basically like, I would love for this to happen. I will make all these great offerings to you if you so help me. And the two winds don't hear him. However, Iris does. So Iris then carries this message to Zephyrus and Boreas. And what's really funny about this scene is that Iris goes because she knows they're at Zephyrus's house. And when she goes there, they're literally sitting there like having dinner. Like these two gods <laughs> are just hanging out on like a Friday night or something. And they're just like, oh yeah, this is a fun time. Iris then shows up and she just sort of like stands in the doorway and she's a bit like, I'm clearly interrupting something. And both of them notice that she's standing there and they're like, oh and so then they stand up and they like encourage her to come in, to sit down with them. They're like, we have enough food for everybody. And Iris is like, no, I just have to, I just have to ask you to do something because Achilles really wants it done. He's been praying to you and you guys have been too busy doing this, playing Uno, whatever the f you guys are doing. So then she relays all the information to them and they're like, oh yeah. We can totally do that. And so then together they leave their little weird dinner party that they're having. They go down to Achilles. They sort of like, you know, they go over the sea. It's like a very dramatic uh, trip down to where Achilles is. And then basically they just like start throwing all of this blazing fire onto the pyre so that it can light. And they do this like periodically throughout uh, the night so that Achilles can have his little morning moment. And then the whole pyre is like ablaze and the gods are just making sure that it's still on fire. That is a really weird scene that genuinely happens. I just love it because it's just so weird that we have like Achilles who's mourning, he's in the Camps, he's doing exactly what we think Achilles would be doing. And then these gods are literally just like hanging the f out. And I just love it because I think it's really, really bizarre and it's just really odd. And it's just like this very normal scene, which you like don't expect, especially for the gods. But either way, that is a scene that genuinely happens. It is a, a highlight of this book. The rest of it is still pretty boring. And obviously as this is happening, Achilles is actually making the offerings that he did promise the gods because if he didn't do that, then they would be like hella pissed. But don't worry, he is doing that as he's still like, in this close lamentation with Patroclus. So when the actual fire itself, the big part of the fire dies down, Achilles is now exhausted. Okay, this man hasn't slept, hasn't eaten, hasn't drank anything. He is so tired because the day before, remember, well, two days before, he's been dragging Hector's body around Troy. So he is so tired at this point that he literally just rolls over on the beach and he falls asleep. And this doesn't last very long because then this like group of heroes, this like Greek heroes, once again, none are specified, but these group of Greek heroes come over to the beach and they start chit chatting and their chit chat wakes up Achilles, which I'm like, could you not have spoken anywhere else? This is the first time he's asleep. This is the first time he's resting. Let him please. Achilles though rolls over, he wakes up 
up and he looks at all of them and he says, hey, can you guys do me a favor? There are still some embers in the pyre can, with your wine that you're holding, because they drink wine all the time, but could they uh, pour out the last little embers with the wine, which actually wouldn't work, but they wouldn't know that. So either way, he's like, can you please put out the rest of the pyre? Can you also start gathering up Patroclus's bones, which won't be hard, he says, because nobody else, not even the animals, were close to Patroclus. And Patroclus is like smack bang in the middle, as I said before, this was important that, you know, all everybody else was like scattered around the outside because the bones of Patroclus are in the middle and they are burned. So he says, can you gather those up? for me as well. So the men though do what they're told. No one is arguing with Achilles at this point. And to be fair, they shouldn't because he is definitely like not in a good mental state at this point. So they do what they're told and they put all of Patroclus's um, like bone dust <laughs> in this like jar and like a golden jar. And it has this like double rimmed of fat in it. I don't know why that detail is included. I think it says something to the state of the jar. I think it's something to maybe how expensive the jar is, but I'm honestly not sure. An expert expert, let us know in the comments. I will pin the comment if you guys can tell me what the whole fat rimmed jar thing is. But either way, that is exactly where they put Patroclus's ashes. Then the heroes take that jar and they bring it back to his camp and then they put a little thin sort of like black veil over this little urn that they have going on. Um, and then they go back to Achilles, but when they're all gonna go and like leave and disperse and like do their thing, cause they went back to Achilles obviously to tell him like, hey, we did this thing. That Achilles actually holds them and holds everybody else in an assembly. And this is where the funeral games begin. I know it feels like the video has already gone on for ages and we've only just started with the goddamn funeral games. Can you tell that I did not enjoy this book? I have never enjoyed this book. We're gonna try and do this as quickly and as painlessly as possible for you guys. So Achilles announces that they're going to do a whole funeral games thing in honor of Patroclus. Now he first of all begins this whole scene by bringing out all, like every single one of the prizes that he intends to offer for each individual games. Okay, so he lays them all out so everybody can see what they are. And he starts off by announcing that there will be a chariot race. That is the first thing that he does. We're not gonna go into detail about any of these games because by God, is it boring and it's useless and really you don't need to know it. If you need to know it for class, just go and read it because I don't wanna do it. And I have never, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I have never ever needed to know any of these details, ever. And I've been studying classics for a decade, for more than a decade now at this point. Never once has it come up even in conversation. Like what happened to Patroclus' funeral games? I'm like, I don't know. So don't worry about that. These are the prizes for the chariot racing because I could absolutely not remember these. Like there is no way in any sort of world that I'm gonna remember what these are. And once again, you don't need to remember them either. So those are the prizes though. And Achilles is like, look, honestly, if I was competing, I would get first prize because like my horses are amazing because Poseidon gave them to my dad who then gave them to me. And so they're like these great horses as we know, because he will not stop talking about his horses this entire book. But either way, he tells us that again. And then instead he asks people to nominate themselves to come up for the chariot race. So the first guy to actually nominate himself is somebody that we don't know, and I don't know why he's introduced now, but his name is Eumelus, and he stands up and he's like, I'll do it. And so they're like, cool, he's gonna do it. He's apparently a really, really good charioteer. This is once again, the only time in all of mythology that he's ever brought up. The second guy to get up is my main man. He has come back. Oh yes, Diomedes stands up. So if you remember, Diomedes has Aeneas' horses, which he's like super proud of, and we did read that little part. So he stands up because he knows he could probably win with the horses that he has. Then is this guy called Echia, Polis, I think is how you pronounce his name. Again, totally irrelevant, never pops up after this. Then Menelaus stands up and then Antilochus, who's Nestor's son, stands up. Now, Nestor does actually bring his son aside before the games begin and he's like, look man, here's the strategy that I'm gonna tell you is that your horses should not be going the fastest because if they go the fastest, they're gonna be the hardest to control. So you should go about it with like really good strategy. You should want to overtake people on the turn because they, they basically Achilles is like, you have to run over to that post in the chariots, go around the post and then come back. So that's it and he does tell them that. So Nestor says, go up to the post and you wanna overtake on the post. That's where people are gonna be most unstable if they're the fastest and that is how you're gonna win uh, the race because you really should because these horses are f***ing great and I'm really great and you're really great so if you don't win then it's like an or else situation and Antilochus is just like alright. After all of this Meriones is the fifth guy to stand up so he's the last person to then uh, nominate himself to take part in the chariot racing. All the guys then take lots from Achilles because they all have to decide what lanes they're gonna be in. So you'll take lots they then all line up in their respective order and then the games begin and then there's this whole chariot race there's lots of drama that happens because Antilochus uh, overtakes Menelaus he ends up beating Menelaus and Menelaus is like not happy about that he's not even happy about it in his chariot he's 
and yelling at Antilochus as they're doing the whole race. But again, we're not going to go into that because it goes on for ages and ages and ages and it really does not impact any other part of the story, nor does it impact any other part of mythology. It's just there. Now, one thing that I love about this, we will give it, I'll give a little bit of detail because this, there's a fun little argument that's needed and you need to know what happens in the chariot race in order to understand the argument. So basically, when the race starts, ignore the Menelaus and Antilochus thing, that when <laughs> the race starts, Eumelus is out in front of everybody else because remember, he's the best charioteer. But Diomedes, because he has Aeneas' as as he overtakes and as they're coming for the home stretch Idomeneus from the stands obviously there aren't really real stands from the stands he's above everybody else so he can see the track a little bit better and he looks down and he sees Diomedes coming in first so he yells out to everybody and is like do you guys see that like where the hell did you melis go diomedes is up in the head up ahead even and he's like what is up with that as he says this so little ajax pipes up and little ajax as we know has a anger management problem so he stands up and he turns around to Idomeneus and he's like dude are you blind stop chatting and literally Idomeneus just snaps back at him and is just like, Ajax, you are the worst of all the Greeks. You need to shut up down there. You're stupid, you're stubborn, and if you're so freaking confident about this, then why don't we put up a wager for it? Let's see who's about to come in first. You say Eumelus, I say Diomedes. Why don't we say that we put up like a tripod up for grabs or whatever? And literally as they are sorting this out because they are f***ing children as they're bickering, Agamemnon stands up and is just like, both of you, Shut up. Like, what does this have to do with the stupid chariot race that we're watching? This is the dumbest thing ever. Both of you stop talking. He also tells them that if they would, you know, stop arguing and just like watch the race and they would see who was coming in first, as opposed to like yelling about it, which is also a very valid point from Agamemnon. So then both of them sit down like children and then we see all of them come in order. So we have Diomedes come in first, Antilochus, we then have Menelaus following him, Mariones follows him, and then Eumelus. Uh, comes in last and that is because he was very much overtaken and Diomedes definitely did do some little shady shit, but you have to read that in order to know what that is so that's the order that everybody comes in now Achilles feels bad that Eumelus actually didn't come in first because even he assumes that Eumelus is going to come in first and so he's like well we should give him another prize and then Antilochus gets mad because Achilles says that he wants to give Eumelus this like horse which obviously was supposed to be Antilochus prize and so Antilochus is just like no, am I giving up my horse? You can't do that. And so Achilles is like, okay, right, fine. I'll give him a course that instead, as long as you chill out. So Antilochus does chill out. But when Antilochus chills out, then Menelaus pipes up. And Menelaus like yells at Antilochus. And he's just like, hey, you totally did some like weird shit with me on the track. That's absolutely not okay. And then Antilochus is like, look, okay, I didn't do anything. However, it's your fault because you didn't make a little offering to the gods, which I did. Antilochus does offer his prize to Menelaus. And then Menelaus says to him, like, look, you're just like really young and your youth came in the way of your intelligence. So you can have your prize. I appreciate the offer because Antilochus does say that if he isn't like really honorable and respectful towards his elders, then like the gods will be super mad at him. And so Menelaus basically says it's totally fine. I just wanted the offer, basically. Absolutely none of this impacts the plot. I just want to highlight that. And then even Nesta gets a prize because Achilles gives him part of the prize as well. And he's just like, oh, you can take this because you're super old and you won't come back into war again because you're like really old and you're probably gonna die before then. And Nesta is like, yeah, you're probably right. And then he like recounts this whole thing of how he one time at one point, this is totally typical Nesta, he like <laughs> talks about how he he had taken part in somebody else's funeral games and you're reading it and you're just like, one, the chariot race doesn't impact my life, two, the story doesn't impact my life. Why the f does this scene even exist? Genuinely, it is a struggle to get through as it is a struggle for me to tell you what it's about. But anyways, there's more. This isn't the end of it. Achilles then sets up prizes for boxing. Can you just tell by my voice that I'm so not interested in this anymore? But either way, he sets up prizes for boxing. They're really great prizes. And he's like, the winner gets this, the loser gets this. Here are the two prizes for the winner and the loser, right? I, once again, cannot remember them, did not write them down because it's not that important. So. Uh, this is what they are gonna win. We then have this guy who has literally never popped up before. This is his name. He pops up and he's like, I'll do it. And apparently he's just a great boxer, okay? And then we have Urialis who stands up and he's like, well, I'll fight him. And so then they get into the circle together and this guy punches Urialis on the cheek and he just knocks him out. Like he KO'd really quickly and you're just like, oh. That was fast. And so literally this guy picks up the Neurialis and sort of just like walks him out of the middle of the circle whilst Neurialis is like spitting up thick blood. So then he he loses and that's the boxing done. Achilles then puts forward the prizes for wrestling. That is the next one. Oh, nearly forgot that. So then there's prizes for wrestling and he says like, who wants to get up and compete in these? And so we have Big Ajax who wants to compete obviously because he's massive and then we have Odysseus who wants to compete because Odysseus is just like I'm here for the ride I might as well so they then start grappling each other and basically they're just as powerful or they're just as weak as each other I think it's just as powerful but like you know you could argue either way so they then just grapple neither of them basically wins and it's just like a tug of war at this point they're like scratching at each other's backs like trying to get each other on the ground and so Achilles just deems it a, a draw and he's just like you both win which what was the point of us reading that then there is yet another competition as if we're not already bored enough from all of those very riveting fights we then have the foot race the 
the foot race is the next one. Again, Achilles is like, okay, this is the start, that is the end. Who wants to come and compete? And again, he puts out all the prizes. Here are the prizes for the position that people come in. In the foot race, we have Odysseus, little Ajax, and Antilochus who compete. Antilochus is pretty irrelevant I'm not gonna lie he literally doesn't even come up to like possibly winning so basically it's really just between little Ajax and Odysseus and they start running and Odysseus can see that the little Ajax is ahead of him but not like too much and so he literally starts like running on this guy's heels right like like literally Hermit tells us that he's like clipping little Ajax's shoes and it's getting on little Ajax's nerves because he can feel Odysseus like breathing behind him and all of this and Odysseus like prays to Athena and he's like hey please help me this would be great could you like help me run really fast and blah blah and so then he he does, Athena does, obviously Athena hears him, and Athena helps him, he then ends up running to win, but what she also does, which Odysseus did not ask for, but she also has little Ajax get unbalanced, so he gets unbalanced in this little patch of the grass where Achilles had previously sacrificed a bunch of these like cattle, so there's like a lot of cow sh there basically and um when he falls over he falls like face first into like cow dung which is wonderful so Odysseus then wins and then little Ajax comes in second little Ajax is super mad about it and Antilochus comes in last now little Ajax does say that the only reason why Odysseus won is because he has a goddess watching over him and it was totally unfair but at the same time like there is a goddess and Odysseus is like it's not my fault that I'm favorite and that I'm brilliant and that you suck. I mean, he doesn't literally say that, like, please don't write that in an essay, but like, that's how I interpret that conversation. And then lastly, when Antilochus comes in, Antilochus is like, well, of course I was gonna lose because the gods always favor the elder. And so those two are older than me, I'm the baby. The only people who could beat them would be Achilles because Achilles is really great and he's really fast and he's like really powerful. And that is just Antilochus's way of wanting to get more of a prize and it works. He basically gasses up Achilles so well that then Achilles is like, you know what? You get an extra half talent of gold. And so then he gives Antilochus a little bit more of a prize for just being a suck up, which is like a really weird little interjection. But it reminds us all of like the younger sibling. My sister has definitely done that where she's just been like, oh my goodness, here's this, this, like, this really nice thing that I'm gonna say because I want more credit. And she always got it. So actually Antilochus, I see it. There are still two more competitions. Can you absolutely believe it? What I've described to you is not boring enough. We are literally only at line like, what are we, 700 or something at this point? I don't even know. We still have two more competitions. The first one is that Achilles says that people have to come, you know, dressed in like full armor. Two men have to be uh, nominated. He also puts out the prizes for them, obviously. Two men nominate themselves. They then come in full armor and the first man to get a spear through the other guy without killing him, just like drawing blood a little bit, will win. So we then have Big Ajax and Diomedes who stand up. Once again, my main man stands up. He wants to compete, which I'm like, yes, we want to say more of Diomedes. So the first blow comes from Big Ajax. He actually gets it straight into Diomedes' shield. And then in retaliation, Diomedes throws his spear because he can see like a little bit of, of armor that like isn't covering uh, Ajax. And he gets it over Ajax's mahusive shield. I don't know how, but he gets it over it and it's like going straight for Ajax. And then all the Greeks like shout out because they're terrified for Ajax's life in that moment because like Diomedes definitely would have killed him. So Ajax ducks. Um, and then all of the Greeks beg Achilles to call off this little altercation. And then Achilles deems that Diomedes is the winner because he was about to draw blood from Ajax. And so then he gets the main prize and then Ajax uh, walks away with uh, the secondary prize. Actually, the prizes for that are pretty cool. Now that I just remember off the top of my head, I do remember what those are. So on one side, we have half of Sarpedon's armor and on the other side, we have the other half of Sarpedon's armor because obviously Patroclus had killed Sarpedon and he had stripped Sarpedon's armor. So that is what the two men win. And then the winner, Diomedes, also wins this like very beautiful like cup to go along with part of the armor. But either way, that's a cool prize that I remember. But we have the last competition now that Achilles puts forward to the men. Oh, actually I lied. We have two more games that are actually coming through. So we actually have the first of which is that Achilles basically says, whoever throws this like lump of iron uh, gets it. Basically, it's like this really amazing like lump of iron. So whoever throws it the furthest and then these like three totally irrelevant people stand up, they all throw it. And then the most irrelevant of all of them wins. He throws it like way past all the others and way past the field. So he wins. That one's like not really all that important. Then we have the archers compete. So then the next one after that are these two archers. Obviously, it's going to be Tusa and Meriones actually gets up, which I didn't know that Meriones was a really good archer the first time I read it until I read this scene. And then now whenever I go back to it, I'm like, yeah, okay, Meriones is like, a bad man. So their prizes are as follows. And what Achilles says is he says that the competition is basically he has tied a pigeon to a string and then that string to a pole. And it's like really far away. And he's like, okay, whoever hits the bird wins. And then whoever hits the string and breaks the string, that's also an option. Then you win second prize. And if you don't hit the string, then you're a 
and lose. I mean, it's not really an option. They're both really, really good archers. So Tusa ends up going first. Tusa ends up hitting the string instead because he did not, in the moment that he fired back, he did not pray to Apollo. Apollo is really miffed by this. So Apollo purposely makes him miss the pigeon. So he hits the string instead and the pigeon actually starts to fly away, right? It starts to like fuck off because it's like, great, I'm free. And Mariones very quickly has to get up his bow and arrow and he ends up pulling back. He prays to Apollo though. He's very smart. We love Mariones. He prays to Apollo. He fires his arrow back. And as the bird is flying away, Mariones hits him right underneath the wing and the bird falls to the ground. And everybody's just staring, being like, holy sh Okay, so he ends up winning, he gets the better prize, and Tuso walks away with the lesser prize because he did not pray to a god. Which I think is really petty, but like, fine, whatever. Now the last one, the last one doesn't really count because it's not really a competition, that Achilles actually, he does say that there will be a last competition between the um, spear throwers, like those people, javelin throwers, right? So he says that you guys are gonna go next, and you have to throw a spear and, and all of this and just show like basically the same thing as the archers. But one of the people who wants to compete is Agamemnon. So Achilles says that there's not even gonna be a competition because Agamemnon is obviously the best one. Whether that's real or not, we don't know. He's probably just trying to gas Agamemnon up because of like all their beef. So he says that Agamemnon by default wins that round. So Agamemnon then walks away um, with his prize, which he then hands off to Talthibius. And this was the prize that he got, which he's like really, you know, like, oh my goodness, look how great I am. And Talthibius then walks it back to Agamemnon's tent. And that is the end of book 23. That is genuinely one of the most boring books I've ever read in my life. It is so dull and I'm not even gonna try and pretend like it isn't. Well, if you've enjoyed this series, it means the absolute world to me that you guys have been watching for this long because I know that, you know, people have been so excited for the next episodes to come out and all of this. So if you guys have been enjoying this, then please don't forget to hit that like button and the subscribe button so that you can continue to support the channel and continue to support me so I can make more fun videos for you guys. But yeah, we'll be seeing you next time with the last episode of this whole series and yeah we'll be seeing you then